I used to be very squeamish so I saw a little bit of blood before this day. But when we got in the plane here, there was 25 or 30 wounded. Some had belly wounds, some had jaws shot off, arms and legs missing. And the shock was so great, from then on, blood never bothered me at all. I'm Lloyd Bentley, and I was born on March the 30th, 1921, in Calvin Township, which is about 12 miles out of Mattawa near North Bay. I served in England for 28 months. When I first joined up, we sent me from Sault Ste. Marie down to North Bay. That's where I, enli where I was officially enlisted on October the 1st, 1941. And then on the start of September 42, I came to Brantford. And uh, we we're supposed to get 160 hours in 16 weeks. Uh, we only got 120 hours in 19 weeks. The weather was so bad. So no, we didn't really graduate. They just simply kicked us out. I was no heck of a pilot. But on the final landing, I landed between two 20-foot snowdrifts. And I crabbed in and, and watched the instructor for about five minutes. It's one of the funniest things I ever saw in my life. I'm on his left. And for about five minutes, all he could do was bite his lip, make faces and look over at me and shudder a bit and look back. And, and finally he says, well, Bentley, there's only one consolation. Not always the best pilots live the longest. <laughs> I learned a lesson from that. So I never took any chances I didn't have to take. My wife and I had got engaged on January 19th, 1943. I thought I would get my three months operational training in Canada, but they decided to send me right overseas. So I phoned my wife from Summerside to say, if you want to get married before I go over, it's up to you, but I'll leave it up to you. I said, I don't think it's right that you should hang around, do nothing. I might never get back, or I might be three or four years, and you can't, I don't want you sitting at home. I want you to go out and go to dance and enjoy yourself. I intend to do, do the, to dance if I'm over in England because I don't drink, I have nothing to do. So I intend to go to dances. So we got married on that understanding. And so when I got back in Brantford, she had the bands read in the Anglican Church three times on Sunday. And so we got married on Tuesday morning and we had a 10 day honeymoon before I went overseas for 28 months. She was a doll. She used to write me practically every day, and I wrote her every day for 28 months. That's my wife just before I got married. Doreen Doris Richards. Oh, she was real blonde. Most beautiful hair. <laughs> most beautiful hair you ever saw in your life. When I went over to England, I took several courses, advanced flying and blind, blind bat course, blind flying. And then they set me up to Northern Ireland to, uh, for operation training. It's called a DC-3 or Dakota or a C-47. The Americans call it a C-47. It's got a 95-foot wingspan. It could carry about five tons of, of supplies. And then eight, there'd be eight of them and eight people in the plane besides. And it was very easy to fly. The paratroops went out here, of course. There'd be a line and they just went out and then the, well, they, they pulled and dropped off at the end. But that's nothing. There's nothing special on there. I mean, paratroopers are pretty special. <laughs> <laughs> they sent us out to Egypt. On the way out, we were attacked by a, a f several squadrons of JU-88s the third night out. They managed to sink about three of our ships, and we shot. they shot down eight or 10 of the German planes. That was me in Egypt. 
December 43. That's the Sphinx and that's the uh, Pyramid of Chops. Stalin met Roosevelt and Churchill at a conference just about the time we were in Egypt. And Stalin told them straight they had to start a second front or they couldn't hold the Germans. So they shipped us back to get on transport command. On the way back, all we had to eat was corned beef. I've always enjoyed corned beef, but the English had been living on corned beef for, for about three or four years. And they, the English bunch, they didn't want to eat it at all. They just decided it almost made them sick. I was almost murdered on that ship. There were, they, they, I used to make them sick if they saw me eating. <laughs> it was kind of amusing in a way, <laughs> but I was hungry. In this third section of the newsreel record of our invasion, these further graphic pictures show the consolidation of the beachhead positions and the thrust in land. The weather was none too good, but the little ships plugged on manfully to the beaches, bringing enormous support in manpower and weapons. D-Day was supposed to be on, happen on July the, or June the 5th, but because of the bad weather and the, and the channel was very rough, they decided to put it off till June the 6th. At midnight June the 5th, we had a job of dropping paratroops about five or six miles inland from, from uh, Juneau Beach. 400,000 people took part in D-Day and about 156,000 landed that day. And there was about a quarter of a million in the Navy and Air Force and air crew. They went from England in three different groups, three different lines. The westernmost line were the Americans, and the ships were down below. And then they had probably fighter planes, and then transport, and medium bombers, etc. cetera. But there were several, several heights of them. The, the westernmost land, landed at Utah Beach Nate, near St. Mary de Glees. And then the middle lane landed at Omaha Beach and they were battling. They had the, really the toughest fighting of anybody. And then the west, the easternmost lane was the British and everybody else. And when they got nearer to shore, they split into three different lanes. And the westernmost lane was, was Gold Beach, were British. The middle lane was the Canadians at Juneau Beach. And then the easternmost lane was the British, French, Free French, Norwegians, et cetera, et cetera, Dutch. And they landed at, at Sword Beach. As you got near England, you could see all the three lanes are still coming out, about 30, well, 40 miles wide probably. I swear you could see about two or 3,000 aircraft or 13,000 aircraft took part. And there's between five and 7,000 ships. And uh, I, I swear if I could had long legs and stepped out on those ships, I could have walked back to England, they were so thick. It was the most amazing sight I've ever seen in my life. Operation Market Garden was from September the 17th as far as transport command, was through to September the 23rd. On Thursday, we were late getting over there on the way back near Eindhoven. We just nicely got in one of uh, several little wee clouds that were up there and uh, going south. We looked up just after we got into, into this little cloud and we could see uh, fighter planes flying about five or 600 feet going north. And within a minute, we could see flashes hitting the ground and uh, we get back to England and find out that only six out of 13 of our planes got back from our squadron. And they shot up half a transport command that day. They were so badly shot up that no transport planes didn't fly on Friday. And on Saturday, uh, the, the Germans were really ready for us by this time. And uh, several planes had their oil lines shot up when we went over Arnhem, the bridge too far. And so uh, our oil line, oil line was damaged, and we got back as far as Eindhoven and scraped over the power lines that went from Phillips plant in Eindhoven out to the North Sea. And the, this was the first day that we had captured that airport. 
the Germans were in the west, southwest corner of the airport in a bush, and there was a temporary landing strip on the southeast corner of the airport, which would be possibly a mile and a half, two miles away. And we managed to land there, but we didn't stop in time and end up in a potato patch. And so we're very lucky because Jimmy Springsteel, a friend of mine from Sault Ste. Marie, they had to land where the Germans were and the crew were all killed getting out of the airplane. So we were very fortunate. I go see Jimmy Springsteel's grave in Arnhem. He's buried in Arnhem Cemetery at Osterbeck. In March, April, May 45, they sent 16 of us pilots to take long-range transport courses in northern England, a place called Crosby on Eden. I didn't take part in the crossing of the Rhine. And out of the 16 uh, pilots, I was only seven of us passed. And I had my head damaged in July the 15th, 1944. So in spite of my dizzy spells and headaches, I managed to get the equivalent of a, a commercial pilot's license. But I never flew one hour after the war. When the war was over, that was it. And we were too late to fly troops to fight the Japanese by the time we finished the course on June the 13th, 1945. And so they sent us back to the same squadrons. And I guess partly because I, I was the only one in the squadron who had this course, I used to fly Polish generals over to Supreme Headquarters in Frankfurt, Germany, in my condition. <laughs> I didn't fly one hour after the war in spite of having the, the commercial equivalent of a commercial pilot's license. And I went back to the Royal Bank for three years. We were, used to work 70, 80 hours a week and it's a lot of stress, so I couldn't stand up with my headaches and dizzy spells. So I quit the bank. I, I've had a good life, though, so just the same, but things didn't work out the way I expected when I went in the Air Force. <laughs>